Welcome to Real Estate Radio Live, an informative and engaging hour discussing everything you need to know about the world of real estate. Your host, Tom K. Wilson, provides you with insight and guidance from his years of experience as a successful real estate entrepreneur on how to buy, sell, finance, and invest in real estate, and much, much more. Here's your host for Real Estate Radio Live, Tom K. Wilson. Nice to have you back with us. We have a special guest today, Dr. Doug Duncan from Chief Economist of Fannie Mae, and we'll bring on here in just a moment. Thanks for tuning in to our Real Estate Radio Live program, your number one source for all of your real estate needs and education. We're broadcasting from the number one business radio station in the San Francisco Bay Area, KDOW AM 1220, the Wall Street Business Network. I'm Tom K. Wilson, your host for the 2 p.m. Wednesday edition of Real Estate Radio Live that comes to you Wednesday or uh, Wednesday and Friday at 2 p.m. and daily Monday through Friday at 3 p.m. along with my co-hosts Joe Cachera, Mike Ambrosio, and Bobby Decker. If you can't make our live show, you can catch our podcasts on reradiolive.com and my programs you can catch on tomwilsonproperties.com or on iTunes or on YouTube. Remember, you can always go to tomwilsonproperties.com and sign up for our weekly newsletter that keeps you uh, up to date on what's happening in the world of real estate as it relates to economics. And there are also a number of white papers and reports on uh, commercial products and syndications as well as uh, houses to see what match uh, what product matches you best. Wilson Investment Properties is a turnkey provider of residential and commercial products and syndications. And we always welcome your suggestions, your questions, uh, thoughts about topics and guests that you'd like to have, and we can offer a free consultation as well. So Dr. Dirk Duncan is uh, someone who <clears throat> I had the pleasure of meeting back in uh, about 2008 when the sky was falling, and he was out here on business and was good enough to come down and, uh, and speak to us and became instant friends. He's uh, very uh, wonderfully gracious and likes to engage in the real world instead of just being up there in the uh, offices on near Capitol Hill. Uh, Doug has got a PhD in economics from Texas A&M. He was with uh, Mortgage Banks Association as their chief economist for seven years. He's been with Fannie Mae for nine years, won many awards for uh, having some of the most accurate forecasts, and he's ranked by Bloomberg Business Week as one of the top, uh, as the top 50 most powerful economists. Uh, what does Brandy think about you being powerful, Doug? I, I'm just a husband. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the program. Nice Thank to have you, you with us. Thank you. Well, as you can see, I've um, we've lined up a number of questions here, uh, partly from our your friends and uh, mm-hmm. and mine from. Howard Blum and, and Sean O'Toole and, uh, and Bruce Norris and, and, uh, and even myself. So, um, it's a tough if, crowd. If we, oh, it is a tough crowd. You, you know us well, exactly. <laughs> maybe too well. So let's go, um, let's go down this list of uh, things that we'd love to hear your opinion on. And uh, I'll start off with just uh, asking why you think Fannie Mae recruited you in 2007. Did they know they needed help? Well, they, uh, their chief economist at the time, Dave Burson, had left, uh, and so uh, they wanted to, to fill the position. Uh, they knew me from uh, my time at the Mortgage Bankers Association, uh, and uh, the MBA was thinking about some changes as well, so they reached out to me. Do you think they felt um, they were – do you think they, they recognized that there was impending trouble and they needed someone to help re-steer the ship? Uh, yeah, clearly that was that was the issue because the um, the Fannie did its last capital raise the day before I joined the company, and Freddie didn't do a capital raise, and that was sort of the that was the tipping point. And shortly thereafter, conservatorship. So, and I'd been a sometime critic of the organization from my platform at uh, MBA, uh, and it wasn't because MBA was making me be a critic. So. The question is, do you want to put your money where your mouth is? And I knew uh, the chairman of the board uh, at Fannie because I'd worked for him, and he asked me to come and see if I could help. Think you've made a made a difference? You think you've made uh, accomplished things there? It's uh, it's tough. It's tough in a big uh, organization. There's so much inertia, right? As yeah, to, it is. It's tough to turn it. I mean, Fannie Mae does one thing, right? They do mortgages, um, and they've been doing it for a long time since 1938. 
Uh, so it is hard sometimes to change points of view. I, I believe I've had a had an impact. I hope so for the positive. Uh, and the company has made progress since those days of the conservatorship started. What can you think of an example of something they've done or policy they've implemented that uh, that you you uh, uh, influenced or? Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, most recently, we, we've. Yeah, implemented the first strategic plan that the company has had in about 20 years. And most of the, the pen work over that kind of the coordinating work was in my area. That was one of the things I said when I came to the company as I didn't want to be just the chief economist and some talking head. I wanted to be involved in Probably. the strategy of the organization. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> now, right. I'm certainly not taking credit for the whole thing. That was a business-wide uh, effort, but we coordinated it within our group. Uh, so what's the future now, Fannie Mae? Uh, I know when we've talked in the past, there was a plan to cut it down by 10% a year and so forth and eventually phase it out. Uh, what's, what's the current status? Well, certainly the portfolio is on a downward path by law and regulation. We'll be capped at $250 billion by 2018. So that's in, in progress and will continue. Uh, related to that is the issuance of credit risk transfers, which is a new technology and security in the marketplace, which helps uh, get private capital, sharing the risk and taking some of the contingent liability away from taxpayers. So the expectation is we can't control when the Congress and the White House make an agreement on how to reform the secondary market, but we can't just sit on the resources. We need to be doing something to make a contribution to the effectiveness of the market. So we're we're doing that. So uh, will be the point, Will there be a point when Fannie Mae uh, cease to exist, or you think it'll change its role? Um, that's hard to say. I, if I had to bet, I would say at some point there'll be a, uh, an action, a legislative a regulatory action that will expunge the name Fannie Mae. Uh, this is just a Doug guess. Uh, it, it, but it may simply happen over time. For example, if uh, there's been some discussion of turning us into either a publicly owned or privately owned utility, if that were the case, then I would I would think that the action, legislative action that sanctioned that would probably lead to a name change. But the functions that are performed by Fannie Mae will be, continue to be needed by the market, I think. What do um, you think there's um, going to be any loosening of money for investors uh, and the number of loans allowed in any time in the near future? You and I have had those discussions for some time, and that was what kind of stimulated our, our, our trip back east. That's right. Yeah, and and you know, I mean, you know, I'm in favor of that. Yeah. Uh, actually, I think that the emergence of the institutional investors in single-family properties, which happened as as a part of the response to this, has uh, increased the odds of that actually happening because people now see that as within the company and outside the company see that as a viable business model that's got at least an intermediate-term life to it. And ask the question, well, shouldn't we be providing some liquidity in that space as well? So I think actually- You're talking about like uh, <clears throat> B2R, of, yeah. Of, yeah, Blackstone. Yeah, Blackstone, and, yeah, all those these folks. different institutional- Yeah, mm-hmm. so I think that's raised the, the awareness within mm-hmm. the company that, hey, you know, it's not just individuals, but there's a reason that there are rentals in the, prop, in the market mm-hmm. and that single family rentals are actually the biggest share of the rentals in the market. So maybe we should be involved in and if, that. Space. And if you treat them on an income basis, like we do in multifamily or commercial uh, and, and uh, that uh, house uh, house model fits that, then, mm-hmm. uh, then, then you've, uh, in yeah. fact, some ways I think it's less risk because it can be uh, disposed of individually instead of waiting for the mm-hmm. big buyer for multifamily property. Yeah. yeah and I, so I think you'll see some work in the company to try to, to try to uh, get involved. Uh, I've heard rumors about uh, moving the limit to 20 instead of 10. Is that, uh, yeah, it's, I don't know of anything formal uh, discussed within the company on that, but um, that if you're going to get involved, you'd have to you have to think about how do you uh, expand it as a product offering. Mm-hmm. Uh, Howard Blum uh, asked, uh, considering that the Fed is owned by a large group of banks, <laughs> 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 which uh, makes the assumption that that you or someone agrees with that. Does the banking sector exert any influence on the Fed monetary policy? Well, I think there's no question that they they certainly talk to the Fed. Uh, how the Fed weights the voice of large banks versus small banks versus non-banks, uh, only the Fed knows. But certainly the, its origins come from the banking system, so it would be hard to ignore the the that relationship. 
Um, in speaking to some of the leadership at the Fed board, they certainly ask questions that you, you could say uh, have their origins in the thinking of larger institutions. That doesn't mean they're not important questions. Uh, so I, I don't think they are ruled by the big banks, if that's the instinct, because they, they do recognize a broader responsibility. Uh, and today that broader responsibility even includes global uh, issues because mm-hmm. they've, mm-hmm. you know, inter-central bank, Lending has been a recent uh, a phenomenon over the last few. Well, years. Well, they certainly have a big voice because they're big, but uh, you think they um, they they, mi- they mix in with a uh, lo- lot of other inputs. Yeah, I think they're sensitive to the fact that in the local communities, the small banks are actually the voice of influence, and and they need to be cognizant of that. Was it uh, was it good that uh, we bailed out the some the banks and the large companies? Was that a good thing? And and if we'd not, what would have happened? Well, we need a payments mechanism. That is, people need to be able to buy and sell things and make payments to people and receive payments from people. The, it, that system was on the verge of collapse. So that system needed to be saved. How individual institutions and their shareholders were treated, I think that's really the point of debate, whether or not shareholders paid the right price. And certainly you hear that in the political discussion today. There's a lot of uh, frustration with people about Main Street versus Wall Street, and the big banks are in the middle of that. So I think that's the question. We needed to save the payment system to keep our economy moving, but how individual institutions were treated. Would you have done something different in hindsight? Um, You've been Zor. Boy, it's hard to, you know, and you're not there in the heat of the moment. It's yeah. awfully hard to say what you would do. Um, uh, yeah, my special, instinct, fo- special forces under fire has to rely on instincts. Right? That is it. That's exactly right. So um, I'd hesitate to second guess folks not having been there. But uh, in the aftermath, thinking ahead, what would you do the next time? I would say there needs to be a thought about how shareholders will will be treated in those institutions if they're made whole, but they were part of the problem. That's that's where the inequities. Mm-hmm. The shareholders are the ones that get saved. Yeah, what happens to them. Right. Mm-hmm. So maybe they came. Maybe they came out. A little bit too cleanly. For- uh, I think that's the perception in the in the, um, in the populace. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, do you think uh, real estate and stock markets overheated right now? I think the Fed is pumping it up. I think you got the evidence of that when they raised rates for the first time in nine years in December, and this some steam came out of the came out of the market. I, to me, that was prima facie evidence that part of that is simply front running the Fed. Well, we have with us today Dr. Doug Duncan, Chief Economist of Fannie Mae. We're, when he comes back, we're going to uh, be talking about uh, housing, what he thinks, uh, where he thinks that's positioned and where it's headed. Interest rates, of course, everybody wants to know, and I'm sure he's tired of hearing those questions, but he's, <laughs> that's, that comes with the territory, right? Absolutely. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so uh, we're on uh, KDOW, uh, 1220 AM, uh, Business uh, Network. Wall Street Business Network, and uh, stay with us. We'll be back with Doug and uh, get some more uh, good answers here in just a few moments. Stay with us. For more information on today's program, visit reradiolive.com. That's reradiolive.com. Welcome back to Real Estate Radio Live, streaming live on iHeart, TuneIn, and KDOW.biz. For more information on today's topic or guest, just visit reradiolive.com. That's reradiolive.com. Again, your host for today's edition of Real Estate Radio Live, Tom K. Wilson. So nice to have you with us today, and so nice to have Dr. Doug Duncan, Chief Economist Fannie Mae here uh, with us in studio, talking about uh, what's happened in the past, what's going to, uh, what he thinks is going to happen, and uh, and and with interest rates and uh, housing and so forth. So we did, uh, we're giving him rapid fire questions and he's uh, given mm-hmm. us nice, nice, concise uh, answers. And we'll, uh, we'll just keep that going. So um, we just uh, covered that uh, he indeed thinks we're um, overinflated, overheated in the uh, real estate and stock markets because of um, easy money, cheap, uh, mm-hmm. looking for higher things, uh, people looking for higher yields and low interest rates driving up. Yeah, homes again. Yeah, the stock market, I think, is, yep. is prima facie. Um, Howard Blum wants to know, are the, um, let's talk about things a little more specifically now. Uh, oh, before we get to that, one one more on uh, history. 
Uh, to what degree do you think the crash was caused by Capitol Hill political agenda to increase home ownership and therefore subsidizing loans? Yeah, it, it's interesting in the aftermath, you don't hear about the American dream and you don't hear about the motherhood apple pie. It's much more of a balanced view that housing is both owned and rented. So I think that's implicitly mm-hmm. a mm-hmm. recognition mm-hmm. that policy was too heavily focused on putting people in homes. And that, that you can certainly see that in the data. Yeah, and I, I, did you see the big short? I have not. I, I saw it. I thought it was a conspicuous absence of uh, anything to do with uh, federal policy. It, mm-hmm. was, um, it was just an attack on Wall Street. And, uh, right. And they, uh, they were just benefactors down the line, in my impression. Would you, would right. you agree? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Now, the one thing I would say is there's no uh, country developed or undeveloped or underdeveloped that does not have as part of its social policy a housing component. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. The, uh, you, I don't think it's realistic to perceive that you would ever have a system that did not have some relationship mm-hmm. to the government mm-hmm. because it is a central piece of the citizen's it's life. More major, m- matter of degree. That's exactly right. Uh-huh. Yeah. So, but I, no question, the the single minded push toward putting in people in homes whether they could afford it or not uh, was which, a was which a was engineered by <clears throat> subsidized rates and qualifications. and Oh, certainly. That, I mean, the GSEs yeah. were a piece of that. And that didn't start in uh, just the last few years administration. It started a long time ago. Right? Oh, yeah. Four, four presidents back and just kept getting worse. Right? Well, and I, and I would say if you were looking for a single policy issue that, that uh, put the real froth on top of things, it was a change in the capital gains treatment of real estate in the Clinton administration, which uh, removed the requirement of reinvesting the capital gain back in real estate within two years if you took a, a took a tax-free capital gain. Mm-hmm. What that did was open the door to people in rapidly price-appreciating markets becoming speculators based on the, the tax advantage of the capital gain treatment. Mm-hmm. I would say that was mm-hmm. a, the accelerator uh, for the downturn. Very interesting. All right. Let's, uh, let's dive into housing a little bit here. Um, are the unprecedented uh, debt burdens of students emerging from college universities hampering the new household formation? Um, at the margin, yes. Uh, it depends on the degree that the person earned in getting the debt. First of all, did they finish the degree? If they got the <laughs> debt but no degree, that's a problem. <laughs> oh, yes. If they got, I, I don't think about that one here. Yeah, <laughs> there's a lot of people where that's the yeah. case. If uh, they got the degree in a field where the income growth is not strong enough to support rapid amortization of that debt, that can be a delayer. Uh, but if the, if it's in a field where it has good income earning potential, then uh, for many of those households, they'll actually amortize that debt before they get married and have a baby, which are the real keys to becoming an owner. Do you think, uh, back to the home ownership, uh, do you think we're at a healthy percentage now? We've come from 69 something down to what, 64 something? It's uh, 63 and change. Mm-hmm. And I, I think mostly that's driven by demographics. I think you'll see that reverse itself over the next uh, decade. Hmm. I think okay. it'll go back up. Okay. Um, your uh, counterpart at Freddie has gone on record saying that 2016 will be a breakout year for home sales. I'm not sure what breakout means. It's from yeah. Howard. You uh, yeah, got I'm any not, thoughts on that? I'm not sure either. It, it will be uh, up about 3% over 2015. 2015 uh, was up 7% over 14. So another improvement, uh, but uh, uh, if it's looking for a big jump, I, I don't look for a big jump. Okay, we'll uh, come back with uh, with Doug Duncan here in just a moment. We're going to talk about interest rates, uh, something that everybody always wants to know about, and he just has to answer. It's part of his uh, territory he brings <laughs> with him. So we'll dive into that on the, when we get back here on Real Estate Radio Live. This is Tom K. Wilson on the, the KDOW 1220 AM. Stay with us. For more information on today's program, visit reradiolive.com. That's reradiolive.com. Welcome back to Real Estate Radio Live, streaming live on iHeart, TuneIn, and KDOW.biz. For more information on today's topic or guest, just visit reradiolive.com. That's reradiolive.com. Again, your host for today's edition of Real Estate Radio Live, 
Todd K. Wilson. We have Dr. Doug Duncan with us today, uh, Executive Vice President and Chief Economist of Fannie Mae. We're now talking about the housing cycle. Um, Doug, you're getting uh, you're going to add another comment about uh, your counterpart at Freddie saying that uh, we're going to have a breakout year for home sales, and you think uh, whatever breakout means, you think it's going to be modest. We'll still have some gain, but less than last year. Yeah, I don't know. I know Sean. He uh, he actually worked with me um, at Fannie. He's the new Chief Economist over at Freddie. He's a good guy. Um, the uh, Sales in 2015 were up 7% over 2014. Our forecast is for them to be up 3% in 16 over 15. So I don't know how he defines breakup, but I, I see it as growth, but but slowing. Do you think we're close to <clears throat> topping out uh, this cycle in some markets? Yeah, we're, you know, the, uh, our theme for this year is housing affordability constraints as the expansion matures. That recognizes we're now in the fourth longest economic expansion since World War II. Mm-hmm. So this is a late cycle market. And um, the uh, it, the problem is lack of supply in many markets. There's simply not anything, but it's all at the lower price band. And it's the same thing on rental as on owned properties. The, the problem is at the low end. It's more of a problem because we've been focused on income redistribution from a macro policy versus income production. So you're not seeing those people seeing the income growth that's going to be required for them to become owners or really renters. And if they do become renters, it's all class A properties, which is the high rents, which makes it hard to save money for down payments for houses. So <clears throat> what's, what's Doug's guess as to what this real estate price cycle, and of course you realize that the market is hundreds of submarkets and don't right. Do things same time, but, and and that is actually really important because there are some markets which we view as pretty normal. Uh, there are ones that have had steady employment growth, but not off the charts employment growth. It's balanced, so the various sectors are adding jobs, not just one sector. You take a look at the San Francisco, you could say it's got to be one of the toughest ones it, to predict. It really it's just, is just crazy. It yeah, it and it's very heavily concentrated. It's one of the rare markets where high-priced homes pace of price appreciation has outstripped low price homes. <laughs> no, that's uh, one of the rare markets. I've been here 46 years and I still, uh, still shake my head and my jaw drops. It's, yeah. <laughs> yep. That's absolutely amazing. And, uh, <clears throat> and we've got, uh, we got jobs here. We right. High tech, and they're high paying high tech in business many is going crazy and got a third of all venture capital money in the world comes to this area. And, yep. uh, you know, it's, I've seen uh, watching cycle number five, as we were talking before and, I'm I'm sure it won't go on forever either, and we'll have mm-hmm. to drop. But uh, I don't. I think it'll always be here, and it's always going to be a unique market. And uh, I think it was Herb Klein that said something that can't go on forever will eventually stop. <laughs> <laughs> sounds like a sounds like a yogi, <laughs> right? <laughs> <Like> to me. <laughs> um, so did the um, so the Fed finally raise the rate in December just to save face because they've been talking about it so long, and maybe maybe they shouldn't even. Didn't seem like there was data to support it really going up any more than any other months. Now you could say that we should be on more of a free market and should have gone up long ago, but I didn't see any bigger case in December for it going up than before. Did you? Yeah, uh, no. In fact, we had had for some time in our model a forecast expectation that they would move in September. So in our view, they it was September was Char- uh, Lucy pulling the football out from Charlie Brown. <laughs> Everything was ready, and they didn't do it. Now, whether they viewed that as a safe facing, face-saving event, uh, they probably wouldn't characterize it that way. Uh, I am in the camp that they should have been raising a long time ago. Yes. yes. So, um, thankfully, they finally moved, but it doesn't look they'll move much more this year. We actually, I think, have one move in September in our model. Okay. All right. We'll talk more about interest rates when we bring uh, Dr. Doug Duncan back here and And uh, just a moment, thanks for being with us on KDOW 1220 AM, the Wall Street Business Network. Uh, We've got a lot more to talk about uh, with Doug, interest rates, and uh, where the economy is going in the future. Stay with us. We'll be right back. For more information on today's program, visit reradiolive.com. That's reradiolive.com. Welcome back to Real Estate Radio Live, streaming live on iHeart, TuneIn, and KDOW.biz. For more information on today's topic or guest, just visit reradiolive.com. That's reradiolive.com. Again, your host for today's edition of Real Estate Radio Live, 
Tom K. Wilson. Got uh, Senior Vice President and Chief Economist uh, Fannie Mae, Dr. Doug Duncan, with us in the studio here today. Very nice of him to make a trip out here to, uh, to be with us and to uh, be at a uh, couple of meetings while he's uh, out here. We're talking about interest rates and uh, about how uh, he feels that Fannie, uh, I mean, the Fed should have been raising rates probably quite some time ago. Whether or not this one was finally to save face or not, I don't know because the, um, the data wasn't any stronger in December than it was before. Um, so a lot of people say, gosh, you think he, you think he'd tell us what he thinks? And it's like, well, he publishes it. You just go, you need to go to the website <laughs> and yeah. it's right, right there for everybody to see. And in fact, um, you've gotten some pretty good, uh, not only accolades, but awards for, uh, how, um, how good your predictions are. So, uh, well, people say if you want to know what an economist uh, really thinks of the forecast, ask them what they're doing with their own money. And uh, so I invest on my own forecast. So you're seeing what I think. There you go. That's uh, that's <clears throat> pe- having your own skin in the game is a uh, it, uh, it's pretty good uh, credibility, mm-hmm. I'd say. Um, so let's talk a little more about interest rates. Uh, do you you see so you your your prediction is they'll do one more quarter high quarter percent hike uh, right. sometime this coming year. Uh, now, shortly after um, Yellen made that move. She was talking, uh, I think, that same day about uh, starting to uh, investigate uh, negative interest rates. So uh, what do you make of that? Well, uh, she said they'd be reluctant to do that, but they wouldn't rule it out. I mean, it's the kind of thing where you never give away a tool. Even if you don't intend to use it, you'd Mm -hmm. like it out there. Uh, It's hard for me to see how those countries which have uh, gone to negative Interest rates have gotten any economic value out of that. Mm-hmm. So Can you I, name, name off a few of those? Yeah, of course, the Central Bank of Europe, mm-hmm. uh, the ECB, uh, I, I don't see improvement there as a result of that. Japan has gone way negative. And in fact, their sovereign debt now has negative yields all the way out to 10 to 12 years. Uh, that has some really negative down, uh, negative impacts. If you, if you read the stories coming out of Japan, I won't belabor that here, but – if you're having trouble, stay awake at night. Think about Japan for a while. That'll keep you awake. So I, I don't see the Fed going there. But here's the scenario. Our forecast is, as you said, one more rate increase. We put it in September because we have to put it somewhere in the model. Um, and maybe another rate increase or so, maybe two the next year, which means mortgage rates at the end of this year will be where they are today. And maybe not much farther from that at the end of 2017. Remember what I said about this being the fourth longest expansion we've seen? I don't believe we've repealed the business cycle. So somewhere in the next two or three years, because the longest expansion we've had is 10 years, we are likely to see a downturn. So how does the Fed operate monetary policy in that environment? That's why my Mm -hmm. view is they should have been normalizing rates for quite some time. Mm -hmm. So they they don't wind up chasing the Mm -hmm. economy instead of... That's that's exactly right. But they they have since 1994 they have never moved when they had when the market was not prepared for that move and the market today says only one move the do rest you, of this year. Do you see a, a potential of uh, rates at under three percent at some time in the near future? Well, the probability is not zero. It's positive. If we if the Fed is not far from where they are today, <clears throat> excuse me, and we get a recession second half of next year, which I could give you the logic on why that might be a time to think about, then, uh, yes, you could get rates down in the twos. What do you think is more likely that we'll have rates in the twos within the next five years or rates that are uh, more like 6%? Um, That's a great question. Um, That's from Sean, by the way. (laughs) (laughs) He always asks great questions. I like him. Um, I'd say the risks are more on the two side. To be honest, because I I don't, we will need a change in macroeconomic policy to generate growth that would get us to real interest rates, which would drive a six percent nominal rate. So that that if if inflation was held at two percent, that means you got to have the ten years somewhere around four. That means strong economic growth, Mm -hmm. and that's going to require a major shift of macroeconomic policy. If we had free market now, we didn't have uh, the, the the Fed. Where do you think interest rates would naturally be? Um, I think they'd be higher than where they are today, because there would be a focus on the real economy, not on financial mm-hmm. factors. The 
the core problem today that that results in the discussion of income distribution is that we're not macroeconomic policy is not targeted to create income growth. It's targeted to redistribute existing income growth. And monetary policy has us focused on financial effects, so stock buybacks, things like that. That's not an investment in growth. It benefits shareholders temporarily. But what's what really need is needed is a focus on how do you get business fixed investment to pick up so that the investment horizon looks bright to them, which then drives productivity, which is the driver of real income gains. And that's where you want to be from housing's perspective is seeing you, strong housing. You like income. production driving the economy. Absolutely. As opposed to consumer demand. Absolutely. <clears throat> uh, if we raise interest rates, uh, to what degree are we shy to do that? Because we might get our own uh, debt service uh, so we can't afford it and we get into default. Well, uh, let me flip that question a little bit and say uh, the fact that we haven't has allowed the Congress and the White House not to be responsible in terms of fiscal policy and getting our fiscal house in order. So I don't believe that's an intentional uh, mm-hmm. effect of Federal Reserve policy. It's a byproduct, but it's an unfortunate byproduct. Do you think we'll lose the world reserve currency or do you think uh, if we continue to be the least dirty shirt in the laundry and we'll, we'll, we'll hair out? Yeah, I like that. I, I always use the uh, the best looking horse outside the glue factory because yeah. <laughs> <you know, laughs> I grew up on a farm. So, <laughs> um, yeah, I don't I don't think we're in danger of losing the reserve currency today. Uh, and I also actually think China is likely to go a little bit the way Japan went because they have a similarly bad uh, demographic profile. So I'm not I'm not fearful of that. And that would be the country which would be most likely to make a challenge on the reserve currency front. Mm-hmm. Stagnating like Japan is likely mm-hmm. or unlikely? Uh, uh, not the complete stagnation, but certainly a significant slowdown. Mm-hmm. For a long time. Yep. We'll be right back with Dr. Doug Duncan for some wrap-up questions here on uh, KDOW 1220 AM, the Real Estate Radio Live, Wall Street Business Network. So uh, stay with us, and we'll uh, ask him, if he were dictator of the U.S., what economic policies would he put into place? <laughs> <laughs> stay with us. We'll be right back. For more information on today's program, visit reradiolive.com. That's reradiolive.com. Welcome back to Real Estate Radio Live, streaming live on iHeart, TuneIn, and KDOW.biz. For more information on today's topic or guest, just visit reradiolive.com. That's reradiolive.com. Again, your host for today's edition of Real Estate Radio Live, Tom K. Wilson. Well, we're honored to have Dr. Doug Duncan with us today, Chief Economist of Fannie Mae, and we got a little wrap-up segment here. Uh, Doug, what's um, I got to ask you if uh, if you if you were dictator and could uh, and could choose fiscal policy, uh, what would it be, and and uh, and what are your thoughts about uh, this, how well the Fed's connected with the real world here? Well, first of all, if you can pick, pick a dictator, I'm not sure you want an economist for a dictator because they're, they're uh, relatively dispassionate. Um, I, I, I think we need fundamental tax reform. Uh, that's both corporate and individual, and particularly with the focus of how tax policy affects entrepreneurship. We've seen a drop off in small business formation. I think that's a very bad sign. So I think that's one thing. I think a second thing is and corporations moving things it, offshore. Yeah, that, absolutely. Yep. Uh, second thing I think is to tip the balance back toward equity versus debt mm-hmm. to reduce the potential for leverage because mm-hmm. this the crisis that we had was a leverage based crisis. Yep. So alter the structure. The credit bubble, as John says, not a housing bubble. That, that's exactly right. Yep. So I think I would start with those two things, which are uh, fairly straightforward, but supporting of the private sector. And really, I, I, I would like to see a focus on the private sector. So that that's where I would start. Mm-hmm. Um. <clears throat> With said, regard, you I'm said sorry. You said you had a chat with uh, Janet Yellen recently. Yeah, I'm in a business group that meets with them, and then uh, once a year I, I take our CEO and CFO over, over and, and we talk. Um, and, and not only her, but others uh, it, it have asked the question of why is the supply function in housing not functioning properly? Our, our estimate is, according to demographics, we should be building about 1.6 million units a year, and we're at 1.2. Uh, why so slow? And there are a variety of reasons for that, uh, access to skilled labor, the cost to acquire and develop land, uh, things like that. 
But the, the, one of the things to think about here is the there has been recently an upturn in inflation, and the biggest factor in that is what's called owner's equivalent rent. What that means is they do a calculation that says for all those people that own their house, what would they have to pay to rent it if they didn't own it? And then that the how that changes impacts the rate of inflation. If you believe that the supply function is somehow disrupted, then whereas we tend to think of inflation as a change in the general price level, this is one sector where there may be a supply problem. And if it's the driver pushing inflation up, then maybe it is reasonable to be patient uh, on on inflation overall. So I, that's something that's worth thinking about. Wonderful. Great. <clears throat> Great input, great thoughts, very succinct answers from uh, well-respected economists in the country. It's so great to have uh, Dr. Doug Duncan with us. Thank you, Doug, for coming. Thanks for Appreciate having me. Appreciate it. Uh, this is Tom K. Wilson on Real Estate Radio Live, KDOW 1220 AM, the Wall Street Business Network. Remember, go to TomWilsonProperties.com for newsletters. You can get a, uh, you can see this podcast again or uh, send your friends to see it. Also, a lot of education information on our website about uh, uh, houses, rental houses, turnkey, uh, commercial and multifam syndications that uh, you can be playing the big leagues uh, with larger products with uh, higher returns for 50000 a share. And we also uh, always welcome your input. And we uh, look for our events that we have, education events around the Bay Area. We appreciate you uh, being with us today. And it's nice to have Doug on. Uh, Remember, the only thing that matters is what you do next. You've been listening to Real Estate Radio Live. For more information on today's program, visit reradiolive.com. That's reradiolive.com. Tune in, log in, download our podcast. Discover more at reradiolive.com. reradiolive.com.